Hello, my friends, and welcome back to Alien Protocols, the Advanced Protocols Data Project. Well, I promised we'd dive back into the anti-gravity project, so here we go. There are a lot of these gyro anti-gravity projects, a tremendous amount. And in this video, we're going to focus primarily on the gyro anti-gravity devices that have been built. And there have been a lot of these devices built. There are a lot of these electronic gyros currently being built and projects around the world. So <clears throat> this is really um, a big area of development in propulsion and anti-gravity, but it's just one track. And there's multiple tracks for uh, sustaining uh, anti-gravity and attaining propulsion on top of that. So, um, as you can see here, there's Sandy Kid's device from 1986, which is a very similar to Joe device. It's the classic kind of um, uh, gyros where the forces are going perpendicular to each other and produce this effect. E. J. C. Rickman did the same thing. Um, there are a lot of anti-gravity gyro uh, patents games. A lot, and I'll show you a whole bunch of them at the end. <laughs> Professor Eric Lathwaite was a very famous um, scientist and really a phenomenal scientist. And there's a lot of YouTube videos of him and you can see his different devices from ones that just work on electromagnetism to ones that incorporate uh, gyroscopic uh, mechanisms. Uh, Thomas Townsend Brown had a very famous one called the Gravitator. And, he patented his device. Joe Firmage has been working on his for over 20 years, and it started as a legitimate uh, quest, and it's really kind of broken down severely, and essentially has become a pyramid scheme. Uh, Kelly Tippett in the Gannett prototype, you can see these online. Um, they're really interesting, and it's taken the gyroscopic thing to a, a really a new level, and um, um, there's rumors that they're doing very well in terms of results. Uh, there's a lot of people who have done this in different types and impulse engines. And um, Polyakov did another one of these gyroscopic ones. Martin Tajmar and Clovis de Matos have done these before, and we've spoken about them in our previous videos. And in fact, they were investigating whether other devices were legitimate or not as well. Uh, Douglas Tor and Tamir Dada have a gravity generator that was developed at USC and it creates these beams of force and it's a really interesting device and project. That's one to keep your eyeballs on. There's a lot of these different rotating gyroscopic devices. This is one built in a pyramid type shape. Here's one that has multiple different abilities, anti-gravity and energy creation. There's Roy Thornson's famous device that uh, would, he would put in this box, as you see here, and put on a boat in the water, and the canoe would just travel, would just move forward, which showed its uh, propulsion abilities. Robert Cook Jr. and Sr., both of them had uh, anti-gravity devices, and the son took over where the father left off and has been doing some really incredible, incredible work and has multiple different types of prototypes, and he's been very successful with his... Uh, work as well too and there's a lot of high hopes on his uh, work as well uh, the Z machine as they call it Norman Dean created his inertial drive system which is very famous very well known and this one is from our friend Paul Murad and Paul uh, spoke about his device on our interview with him and they're doing a lot more than he's led on and he's been exposed to a lot more than he of course could lead on uh, he was involved in the Apollo mission. He was involved in NERVA, the nuclear uh, rocket engine, <clears throat> perhaps even the Cash Landrum incident, because as you guys know, um, who follow ufology, the Cash Landrum incident is that one where a nuclear uh, engine of some kind, a rocket type engine, blasted a, a family in a car and they all had radiation poisoning and lost hair and it came and removed the, the road even. Perhaps Paul was uh, aware of that. Uh, device. Um, he could have even worked on it, having worked with the Nerva. Who knows, but he's worked on the space shuttle, SDI, a lot of really amazing things. It was really a blessing and a, a real honor to be able to interview him. 
Now there's a current theory that's been doing incredibly well for anti-gravity, uh, and it was originated by this guy, Buckhard Heim. And now these two scientists have been working together on it, Hauser and Drosher, and they've created this theoretical hyperdrive that requires a lot of power to be testable. And uh, only the government has the type of power and resources uh, to test that device. And thus, that's what the government has been doing. And the government has quite a few anti-gravity projects and zero-point energy projects at different locations. Of course, Los Alamos uh, is the location for extensive experimentation of a lot of this UFO-type technology. Wright-Patterson is well known for its exploration of space technologies. And now with the $61 million revamp of the Space Command Center there, uh, you can be certain that very interesting things will continue to be happening at Wright-Patterson. Uh, also, Sandia National Laboratories is a location that's oftentimes overlooked when we talk about UFO technology uh, from propulsion systems and propulsion theory, anti-gravity theory, metamaterial, uh, the whole can of worms. And of course, there's our friend Area 51. And you know what? At Area 51, there just happens to be these 200 and something foot mega hangars right now. And they are absolutely monstrous hangars. And it's very possible they're for a giant triangle device. Hmm. Anyway, there's a part of... Uh, Area 51, essentially, that's much less known. It's called Area 6. It's the uh, south end of the Yucca Dry Lake bed there. And they uh, apparently use that location for a lot of interesting stuff, like the RQ-180 from North of Grumman. It is a very high altitude, very long duration, incredibly accurate surveillance drone that has an ability to see through weathers that all the other types of drones don't have the ability to. And there's other things that are launched out of this end of the dry lake bed. <laughs> and just to show you how many of these gyroscopic and centrifugal type propulsion drives are, just look at all of these patents. Just look. For, these are just from the 70s. Look at all of these patents. Look at them, here's a lot of the drawings. And they're all propulsion systems. Most of them uh, deal with gyros and electrogravitics. It's an amazing, amazing number of projects. And as you can see here, the gyroscopes are embedded into the saucer part of this UFO design but there are many other ways to get anti-gravity, which we'll get into in future videos. <clears throat> but I wanted to really quickly get into some of this stuff and how it relates to Dr. Hal Putoff. Dr. Putoff, as you know, um, has worked on projects for the government all the way back to SRI and uh, the remote viewing projects and lasers and much, much more. And his forte is vacuum energy and vacuum energy propulsion systems and so forth. And he developed a theory of the quantum vacuum that treats certain characteristics of the vacuum as um, changeable. And some of those uh, characteristics of the vacuum that he thinks are changeable are things like the dielectric constant. And he thinks that dielectric constant in the vacuum is polarizable. And if that's true, you might be able to engineer and modify space-time. And if there's a modification of the links and frequencies of this dielectric constant, you can really uh, possibly manipulate gravity itself. Now, there's a few people who have done some high-voltage um, experiments with these kind of small pieces of metamaterial that uh, basically show this propagation of energy. 
And it's a way to uh, essentially absorb a bunch of the vacuum energy. And as you're absorbing the vacuum energy, you're essentially nullifying the vacuum field around you. So you you have a lot more of a freedom of movement if you're able to absorb all that energy as opposed to it fighting you the whole time. So um, it's a really interesting thing. And you have to do these experiments in a very soundproof area like this one with all this sound bafflement here. Because when even if you're doing, you know, very high pulses of energy and a kilovolt and a in picosecond little pulses, you still need a area that's insulated from all sorts of different sounds or effects and things like that. So I just wanted to give you guys a basic little brief rundown. I think we'll dive into the next time we dive into this, some of the Chinese programs and some of the Russian programs and some of their craft. How does that sound? Much love.